Greg Madison, and this is the first episode of The Living Process, a series of conversations with focusing people in a focusing style. My first guest is Siebricht Van Huren. Uh, Siebricht is a clinical psychologist and a professor of clinical psychology at Leuven University in Belgium. He's well known in the focusing community and was the first recipient of the Gendlin Research Grant in order to support his work on looking at the therapeutic process and the process of therapists during therapy, which is something we speak about in this episode. He is co-director of the Meaning and Existence uh, Center at the university. And we talk a little bit about his clinical background, working with prisoners. We talk about the combination of the existential and experiential traditions, which is something that we both share, and what focusing adds to existential therapy and what the existential tradition can add to focusing. And we go into that a little bit more when Siebricht is talking about sort of the more darker aspects of human existence and how in the focusing world we might have a tendency to shy away from those and he's wanting to bring those back in we also talk a little bit about spirituality and how Jendon shied away from that and also some of the principles of working as a focusing oriented therapist i hope you enjoy the episode i found it very interesting and here is my conversation with Siebricht van Huren. Uh -huh. Welcome, Siebricht. Good morning, Greg. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, I'm aware that it was just a few days ago that the Jendlin Symposium was aired and that you were a part of that. Yes. And I'm wondering a few days later now, how that's sitting with you, what the experience was like, um, if there's anything kind of still bubbling away from that? Yes, actually, first and for all, it was a very nice and good experience. Yeah. Um, so I was talking about um, our experiential existential approach, which is a kind of a focusing existential approach, and you have a lot to do with that of course so and what i was trying to explain was a little bit about how jenden was not very explicit about certain existential topics and it has its history why what i really enjoyed also afterwards that you know um making space for darker subjects such as death and the fact that a, probably part of a process is always that we are stuck somewhere and and uh, that we can feel very lonely and there is a lot of meaninglessness. It kind of opened a, a space, I think, for people to talk about, to think about, and it was maybe even a little bit liberating. I don't know, but that that has stayed with me from from uh, the conference, from uh, the Chandler conference, and from reactions. I actually got from from people. Yeah, terrific. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would agree. Certainly, my experience of the focusing world is that those kinds of topics don't often come up. Um, I'm curious why why do you think that is, or why do you think Gendlin didn't give more attention to that? Yeah, I think I don't. Of course, I don't know. We we should ask him. I think you did probably in the past. Yes. Right. <laughs> Uh, but what I what I think is interesting, I actually never met Eugene Gentlin, like person to person. Um, I was on occasions that it was expected that he would be there too, but he was sick or he couldn't come or canceled at the last moment. But I try to read a lot of his writings, watch a lot of his videos. And when I read like stuff he has been written in the 70s, um, he seems to distance himself from um, existential 
psychology at least and existential psychotherapy in some of his papers because I think that's true. I think that's kind of something in that existential psychotherapy world that it can become very conceptual. Yes. And um, as if, um, you know, um, there's a lot of theory and actually it's not always helpful. Like it leads people away from their um, lived experience of their existence. And I yeah. think what Jendlin did was creating a different avenue uh, to experience existence in therapy or just in a focusing partnership. And um, his theory is very phenomenological. Mm -hmm. um, so he's actually starting from the lived experience. And because of that, maybe, you know, along the way, um, he stepped away from certain topics or or he was less explicit about it because maybe it would be in the way of how people experience it themselves. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. my hypothesis, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I remember, um, I think that Jendlin would have said that when existential therapy is successful in some way, it is experiential. Yes. Um, rather than philosophical or cognitive. Um, I remember having a conversation with him because you and I share this unusual integration of existential, although why it's unusual is an interesting question mm -hmm. because they're also very compatible, the existential and the experiential. And I would often have conversations with Gene about the darker side of things and we would argue and then wondering if we're actually both on the same side because i would say um well he would start by saying it wouldn't be so tragic if it wasn't all so beautiful and i would say well it wouldn't be so beautiful if it wasn't all so tragic <laughs> and then he would talk about optimism. I would talk about pessimism. And we ended up me talking about exhilarating pessimism, a kind of pessimism that is life affirming. And he would talk about not pink optimism, a kind of optimism that isn't just some phony positivity. And so I wonder if maybe the sort of things we're bringing together, they actually fit together, but the language is very different. Yes, I think the language might be different, um, and maybe a little bit the the optimistic pessimistic point of view. I don't know the starting point. Mm -hmm. No, I myself, I'm I'm really an optimist. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and also we don't need to divide it into those two categories, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but um, yes, it. The, Maybe it also depends on the stage in your life or the place where you're in. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, mm -hmm. I think also Jendlin, that would not be correct. I almost said worked in the slipstream of Rogers, but that's not that's not correct. Um, but there was a in the 60s, 70s, a lot of op, um, optimism also, and like freedom mm -hmm. and discovering. Um, I don't know. I think the whole humanistic movement has a, a very optimistic um, mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's also why it's a little bit screwed to the optimism, like the living forward process is like something that always leads to a positive outcome. Uh, but actually, I'm not sure about that. I was, yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah, or a focusing process always leads to a felt shift or to like um, kind of something that is rounded or, um, but I'm also not sure about that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Um, lately or in the last years, I started diving into the little bit of literature of Otto Rank and of mm -hmm. Jesse Tuft. And they're actually coming from the psychoanalytic world. Like Rank was one of the, colleagues, pupils of Sigmund Freud, so very close to that first psychoanalytic cycle 
And what is actually interesting to notice is that uh, Rank uh, emphasizes death and life, and the growth process is a painful process, according to Jesse Tuff. So there is like kind of equal emphasis on like the light and the dark or the, the pain and, and the beauty. And some maybe somehow in the development of the humanistic approach, I think focusing is pretty much in that, you know, within that big container or under that big umbrella, there became a shift towards more emphasis on, on the positive side. Anyway, so I, I didn't mention that, but like uh, um, Rogers was really, really strongly influenced by Otto Rank's writings and by Jesse Tuft. And actually in the 70s, uh, we see Jedlin also referring to Otto Rank because mm -hmm. Rank is talking about experiencing the therapeutic process and some yeah. other things. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, it's a big topic, but a very fascinating one, this sort of optimism or positivity. Um, I'm wondering, it, well, it makes me wonder if you have any thoughts about why focusing or Jendlin's work or this experiencing carrying forward process hasn't made more kind of, of, of an explicit impact in the world of therapy. Well, maybe it has something to do with that. I don't know. But maybe yeah. it's because I'm just making some associations. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not. Um, I think therapy is also a lot about pain and a lot about um, openness towards the darkness and to what we are ashamed about or sh ashamed for and uh, very dark feelings, a, a lot of pain. I don't know. And it seems like when you, um, sometimes it feels, and not with everyone, of course, etc. But in the, few, in the focusing community, it's a lot about um, feeling good or mm -hmm. going to a, a good place. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. I don't know. But I feel like maybe I'm making now a caricature of of our focusing community. Well, there is something in the community, in my experience, that that is a little bit like what you're describing. There is an, um, I don't know if it's an expectation or maybe it's even a little more than that. Um, kind of that if you're doing focusing well, it takes you to a positive, better place. And if you're not finding that better place, then somehow you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Like you made a, like, or you don't know how to focus. Yeah, or... yeah, exactly. Yes. But I think maybe this is partly the point you're making is um, if we acknowledge the much more difficult aspects of life, things that we have maybe been hiding from ourselves, not wanting to admit. It's not that it's something that we are glad is true, but there is something in the facing the reality that is a relief. It can feel good to finally admit, I'm ashamed of that. I'm ashamed I did that. There can be a bodily release that actually feels life-affirming, even though the content sounds depressing or difficult or negative yes yes i think that's the point where feeling good or not feeling good like disappears yeah exactly right? because yeah. then we're not talking about like what is a good outcome or or whatever yeah it's an, an openness towards our humanity yeah and to the ambivalence uh, of life yes and yeah. all the ambivalent feelings which actually um i think um create a, a very different way of maybe experiencing life um it broadens mm -hmm. i think our scope yeah um and the problems we are facing it's more inclusive in yes. some way yeah yes. Yes. yes so how did you 
end up in this world? What what brought you into the so, focusing I, world? Were you a therapist already and looking for something else or? Actually, I was very lucky. Um, I was a, a student. Uh, I, when I started studying psychology, we had a professor called uh, Rick Willemars. He was in Ghent, not in Leuven University. And he was broadly interested in all kinds of experiential therapies. So he was teaching person-centered, gestalt, uh, existential therapies. So very, very broadly, actually, and focusing. And we had like a lot of classes, uh, experiential therapy, I think four hours a week theory. And then like, was like really a lot. And then four hours of practicums every week, I think during two years. And this is actually where I learned about focusing. So I was 21, 22, and I had like a kind of a natural click, so to speak, with the work of Chandlin and of mm -hmm. also with Rogers. I th at that time, I thought that the existential stuff was pretty, even maybe a little bit alienating because of the mm -hmm. theory. And, um, and it just like fit, I think, with with who I was at that time and who I still am. And um, so I I have the feeling that my quest or uh, or or my my um, to find focusing was not a hard one, like it was almost on a surfing plate, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, then I studied to become a therapist and it was a training like here typically in Belgium. Um, we tend to integrate uh, different kinds of person-centered therapies. So there was like classical person-centered therapy, but there was also a lot of experiential uh, stuff in our uh, training. So a lot of focusing with Claude, uh, Missia, um, uh -huh. right? And we had like also some EFT emotion focus therapy, although probably it didn't, uh, was not called EFT yet at that time and also a little bit of existential uh, therapy. So for me, it always came always together, mm -hmm. uh, the focusing, but also the other approaches or uh, experiential approaches. And I think just in my life and also as a kid, I think the, for me, the existential layer of life has always been there. As a kid, I, 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 um, I could say that I experienced a lot of death anxiety. I like really had a lot of nightmares. There was like always a sense that I would die uh, as a kid. I also had some like problems with breathing, so probably that that um, uh, that was not um, or that fed into that experience yeah. of uh, vulnerability. So for me, it has like been a kind of logical that those things fit together, that they go mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yeah. So that's interesting. I mean, I hadn't realized to what extent our way into the focusing world was so similar. Uh, oh, okay. my, yeah, my mm -hmm. my way in is is kind of similar. Like you, I just had the good fortune of landing in a university place where focusing was a tiny part of what was on offer. Mm -hmm. And I think like you, there was already something in me that was waiting for it or looking for it or that immediately resonated with it um yeah very very interesting yes and resonating is a good word because it's like kind of recognized um, yes the theory yeah. or recognized the way of working like it was kind of a natural fit so to speak yeah exactly yeah exactly. yeah so do you in addition to your work at the university which i'd like to ask a little bit more about but in addition to that are you seeing clients or do you have time for that yes actually for no i have to think and count um i think for 15 years i had been practicing as a therapist in different settings before i arrived here at the university uh, yeah. to do my PhD. So I worked with prisoners. Um, mm -hmm. the, the therapy with prisoners 
with also uh, victims of violence, like a trauma center. I worked in mental health centers, like different settings, just because I was curious to taste from different settings. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, and I was a, a therapist and I was seeing a lot and lots of clients and I kept on reading and studying a little bit also by myself and doing a little bit of research. So I think for most of my professional career, I have been working as a therapist. And mm -hmm. now I'm still seeing clients because I think there is a real risk when you're a professor, or when you're teaching and you're not seeing the clients or when you're a researcher and you're not working with clients that maybe at a certain point you end up in an ivory tower. Yeah. And you don't know or you don't have like a test or you're not. Um, yeah, probably you understand what I mean. Like, yes. like there is no check anymore, like a reality check. So I, I think that's really important. Absolutely. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. So that earlier work you were involved in, that's those are very intense kind of settings. Yes. I'm curious to know, were you able to integrate focusing or sort of felt sensing into that work or what was that like? Yes, a lot, actually. Um, and I remember like uh, when we started or when I started to do therapy like from a more humanistic person centered experiential point of view with prisoners and with offenders, there was not a lot around, you know, mm -hmm. so it was just me, I think, and my colleague, Ellen Gunst, uh, we were like trying to figure it out how to work experientially mm -hmm. with with these people um it, and actually i did my phd around working with with uh, with prisoners from uh, uh this point of view so and it was very interesting and um i think focusing helped me and helped my clients a lot um also not to um get stuck in that trap where you think that you need to find the truth so to speak mm -hmm. right but like to to be there with that process and um with positive regard be present with with those people like with victims but also with offenders yeah because the stories surprisingly or not were not that different um and i worked especially with people who had like committed very like um intense crimes like murder and with like towards partners towards their children so it was a lot of heavy and existential stuff yeah um, and the existential themes or issues were just there like when you commit a serious crime there is that question like do i still have the right to live or to go on or how do i live with the fact that i'm mm -hmm. guilty mm -hmm. yeah that sounds, yeah, incredible work. And the this may just be um, a stereotype that I carry, but I'm thinking of some of the people that you met in prisons might not have been used to or open to getting in touch with feelings. I'm thinking there's a whole stereotype of kind of the strong kind of macho man sort of thing but you didn't run into that oh uh you run constantly into that okay <laughs> <laughs> i mean i also worked with with, with women in prison uh, female uh -huh. prisoners okay but with, with, with the male guys they all look like john wayne in the hallway mm -hmm. you know they walk like <laughs> <laughs> and um and they sit come in your office and they sit down and suddenly there is a a lot of vulnerability uh -huh. You know, there is a when people feel safe, yeah. there is a shift, mm -hmm. and they know why why they are coming. Also, we I think our setting was pretty uh, transparent. We were not reporting to the prison guards or to the prison system at all because we were a certain mental health service coming from outside the wall, so to speak. So they kind of knew that they actually had nothing to gain by coming into therapy. We didn't write any reports. Mm -hmm. So people who came were came because they wanted to. Yeah. So and that yeah. makes a big difference. Yeah, that makes a huge difference. And it's yeah. interesting that 
the shift you describe in in their manner when they come into the office it reminds me of Jendlin talking about the therapeutic relationship was the difference it made in his body that just he's there with his therapist in his therapist's room and something about that interaction already yes prepared him yes. to be more vulnerable yes like from the moment they opened the door and yeah yeah so the almost like shrinking into little boys in, yeah. in that chair and yeah. um, and the opposite also because because prison is not a, a safe place to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they kind of have to gear up mm -hmm. again yeah. to go yeah. back into the hallway and yeah be that tough guy so yeah. yeah it's so interesting that that threshold between the office and the the hallway and what happens there what happens there yeah yeah talking about um interaction first and environments mm -hmm. and etc mm -hmm. yeah. exactly yeah. can i how do you now I, I i do want to get back to your work at the university a bit but um just bringing in the philosophy as you have how do you understand and i'm asking this just because in the fot world it's a lot of people now refer to interaction first and I'm wondering, how do you understand that in terms of therapy? Like, what, how does it show up? Maybe I could say in, in like the, really practical, like concrete. Yeah, quite concretely. I think it shows up in the fact that as a therapist, I'm also different with my client because the client also. You know, I'm the environment of the client, but the client is also my environment, you know? Yes. Yeah. So we are both each other's environment. And um, I think that's why it's not a one, um, how do you say that? Um, um, the English term doesn't come, um, but it's not a one way direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and mutual. I think it's mutual. I think. I feel it especially, of course, when when I kind of sense the felt sense of the client, which is also right, which is mm -hmm. might be also mine at the same point. I think it's mm -hmm. not always clear whose is what. Mm -hmm. And also, when there is something going, when there is a, a rupture in the therapeutic alliance, because you sense it, you know, yeah. it's yeah. not just the alliance or it's not just the client but it's also painful for yourself as a therapist to notice that something is happening in this relationship uh, that is not going so well or your client is taking distance or you know i think that's very very um noticeable yes um and other things that are noticeable is just being there in that room together on a very very basic level there is yeah and would you share some of that would you share some of the bodily responses that are happening in you or oh yes okay yes. yeah right. for me that's also my um um i think actually like empathy starts from there mm -hmm. from what you sense mm -hmm. uh, and what you sense in this relationship and what you catch or what you don't catch um i think it's you know, Jentlin also calls it crossing. I think, you know, the line between crossing and empathy is not always clear. Of mm -hmm. course, these are also just concepts. Um, but yes, yes, I would. Of course, if I think it's helpful to the client, mm -hmm. or sometimes I, I say like, yeah, I feel something could be mine. I don't know. Do you recognize this? So you kind of stop mm -hmm. with your clients. But I think it's really physically there. like. It's it's an yes. therapy is an embodied experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and would you make any distinction between what you're just talking about and the concepts? I know there's different versions of this, but any of the concepts of transference, countertransference, or would you say that's just a different language for the same thing? Or um, there. Sometimes yes and sometimes no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it also depends what how you understand 
transference and con uh, and uh, contra transference. Yeah, it's um, it's um, maybe it has something to do with what Jendlin called our structure bound experiences, uh, how they also part of this interactional process and patterns of how we are with other people or with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 That if you, as the therapist, if you explore what's happening in you while you're with the client, you have some insight into the client's more general way of being. Yes. And your own way of being. Exactly. Yeah. At the same time, exactly. and how those meet, yeah. or yeah. how they are alive at this very moment in this relationship, or yes. or in this being together. Yeah, um, actually. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. So that does make me curious about the kind of work that you've been doing at the university. What what sort of projects? I mean, I've heard some of your students talking about very exciting things they're doing in their own research. Could you tell us something about what's happening there? There's a lot happening. Yeah, but, good. Uh, Research-wise, um, yeah. what we are trying to do is thinking uh, through different projects is mm -hmm. actually to um, gain some clarity about what, what therapists are actually experiencing in therapy. And especially when um, those exist like what we call existential concerns come up during therapy um, mm -hmm. when the clients speak about it or when there is like a clear existential situation such as group therapy with cancer patients or with prisoners and just we are I think this is like the starting point like what do therapists experience actually mm -hmm. um, how do they respond or how do they not respond or what happens and we have like some very interesting studies running and they all point at the fact that it's not easy for therapists when clients bring uh, really like those existential characteristics of their uh, living process, such as meaninglessness mm -hmm. or like uh, finiteness or like real like deep existential isolation because that's the interaction first yes you know you cannot as an other human being or with two human at least with two human beings in the same room and what the client is talking about actually is also a lot about yourself because yeah. you're also dying at some point and you're also uh you know often feel maybe misunderstood and not completely understood or you feel isolated maybe that's in uh, uh, and you know there's a probably also a lot of meaninglessness in your life you know mm -hmm. and it's also a challenge and we see that many um therapists like they give different reactions but they often retreat yes or close yeah or do things in order not to be with those moments in therapy with those existential moments yeah i, I would entirely agree with you i mean even in my own practice i depends on the client depends on my relationship with the client but certainly some of those issues at this point in my life at this age i can feel in me that it touches the shakiness mm -hmm. and yes. then i have a choice do i take a step into that and share it and make it a, a shared exploration that we both are living with Mm -hmm. Or do I take a step back and interpret the client or make them focus or do something that keeps them away from me? Yes. And that's exactly what we are seeing. And that's also what I recognize myself as a therapist, right? Because yeah. you, it's like you, there is that moment of choice. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, when you're aware of it. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's like, okay, this is close or wow there's so much meaninglessness how on earth will we get out of this maybe not you know and the, that anxiety around it or feeling overwhelmed by it and um so it seems like i mean that's what i recognize what you recognize that mm -hmm. therapists do a lot of work or you know they they uh they try to do something 
in order maybe to regulate their own experiences, which is, of course, we think is not very helpful. And actually was, I think, um, Chandlin who was talking about this, like, you know, um, at least you try to be there with your client and don't use focusing as, as an instrument to, to yeah. go away from your clients or from those topics. And also Rogers was talking about those things. And maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe because we became better and better in doing things, uh, also experientially, like there's a lot of experiential methods to use these days. Mm. Uh, I sometimes wonder if that's sometimes a, a way of experiential avoidance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, I, I myself, I, I do a lot of focusing. I also learned a lot from emotion focus therapy. I use chair work now and then um, when I think it's it's interesting, like empty chair work. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes that's we don't need to talk about that, but it's sometimes easier almost for a client client to do that in a different chair. Yeah. Um, but of course, why do you use it? Like what what's what's yeah, do you use it as because you feel like this will help us to get closer or to be with, with what's happening, or do we use it in order to do something because yeah. of panic? Why are you using it in that particular moment? Yes, yes, yes exactly. Yeah. And why why do you think it is that um there's this tendency in therapy? I mean, certainly there's been theoretical reasons for it in the past, but even now, and certainly this also exists in the focusing oriented world, we aren't maybe that different. Um why do you think it is that in our work, when those moments are touched that are shared, um, what are we afraid of? Good question. Why don't, why don't we open up and just sort of say, oh, yeah, God, I know exactly what, what you're talking about. I can really right. feel it. I... I think probably there's so many reasons. There's so many reasons. There is a, a lot of personal vulnerability, I think. Mm -hmm. So it maybe also depends on the therapeutic relationship. That could be a possibility, but it's also, I think for many therapists, it's what they say, it's like very overwhelming and they feel like suddenly there are existential questions they didn't expect there to be and they mm -hmm. have to, uh, they, um, they really have to think about those existential themes and maybe they don't want to. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe also, I think there is also a shift in, in relationship. You know, you're not a, that maybe you're more a human being or a fellow traveler than, than like a specialist expert uh, therapist who will solve the problem, so to speak. Um, yeah. So part of the I, overwhelm is I how think they so. think they should be as a therapist. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What do you think? Greg, what are your thoughts? Um, I think it, I, th I guess the thought that was going through my mind as I was listening to you is: Would they, would we feel as overwhelmed if we were talking to a friend about that? Someone right. where it was a much more mutual relationship. It's not a professional relationship. Right. So, is part of the overwhelm are trying to maintain some kind of a professional stance the way we interpret it, and we're worried that if we share and are too mutual, that you know, what are they paying us for then? <laughs> yes. What uh, that makes me, that reminds me that a lot of therapists, and I think also myself at some points, you know, if you're powerless. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe that is a little bit aligned to what you're saying like you're supposed to be the person who is helpful and you feel like you're you cannot be of help or you cannot solve yeah, yeah the yeah. client's existential fear or their loneliness or the fact that they will die mm -hmm. or um and that you will die too you know and um yeah it's uh, can feel really 
overwhelming and really feel mm -hmm. powerless and uh, and that might be feel a hard thing as a therapist yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean even i remember in conversations conversations with Jen then when we would talk about these things we would notice how in the talking about it we are already evoking it mm -hmm. and i and i'm feeling that a little bit now that i'm on the edge of feeling the reality of what you're saying rather than it just being a discussion it's like oh my right. god this is actually real this is real this is real you know what i recently or maybe it's a year ago you know what's recent <laughs> read i reread uh the uh rogers boober dialogue or something mm -hmm. and it, it was like the latest translation because or in the former translation it was like so they 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 uh, the you know they did something wrong anyway okay. and rogers is pointing out that actually the like empathy and authenticity etc cetera, etc cetera, is actually only a help to um, come to those moments that we have those existential meetings with our clients and for Rogers he says that is actually the moment of change so to speak um, so I think that's really interesting because Rogers is always you know portrayed as a guy with you know about empathy and about congruence mm -hmm. and positive mm -hmm. regard but he says well it's actually only a stepping stone towards those moments of deep meeting yeah and then, yeah, that's what we sense, um, right? When we are not only talking about it anymore, but also experience it. Mm -hmm. And I think as a therapist, it gets really close. It's really different to also be in the here and now with the client's past or with the client's mm -hmm. issues with their spouse or um, friends or with work or or with a certain disease um, because there's still something of that distance but the distance mm -hmm. seems to shrink um, between me and the client between us and what we are talking about and uh, yeah so we started to call that to give it a, a different name existential empathy like the ability mm -hmm. to be there at those very moments and it's only a couple of weeks ago that I discovered that Gary Prouty was a student of Jendlin. Yeah, was I heard you already, say that. Yeah, was actually yeah. already talking about, he was talking about existential empathy and the capacity to be there at those very moments that mm -hmm. you're just there as a human being with your client. Um, For yeah. me, if it's if it's a description of the kind of meeting we were just talking about, I would want to add another word to that description. Right. I would want to call it mutual existential empathy. Yes, yes. Because for me, the experience is really in that moment of meeting. It's it's like a larger space opens that includes the two of us and all of life. Yes, all of life. I think that's true. It's not just the two of us, but it's all of life. Yeah. And again, you know what is fascinating about Otto Rank, sorry for making those jumps, mm -hmm. but he's actually also talking about empathy and about the therapeutic relationship, but he says it's actually uh, um, about those moments that we experience existence, that we experience Mm -hmm. He says that does guns the whole mm -hmm. that we are in the whole together. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, the, the entirety of the life. Um yes. That he says that that's like yes. the a therapeutic kind of moment. Yeah. Or? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the moment of I don't know if the word change actually applies, but that's the those those moments that um, I think also for clients and also for us as, as therapists are very precious. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, maybe it's the change that comes from that more radical kind of openness. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's also what Mick Cooper describes as the relation of that that's mm -hmm. probably also this 
describing the same moment or other therapists or scholars have also been describing this, describing uh, those moments like moments of meeting or, or you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. it feels like it has um a, a kind of it leans into a more spiritual kind of experience would you say that or yes i think so what i actually find fascinating that is that Jandlin doesn't talk a lot, a lot about spirituality. Yeah. So, you know, we started talking about the, the 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 optimistic and the pessimistic, or the dark and the light. And I wonder by not talking or not addressing death and meaninglessness, if that has a relationship with the fact that he doesn't address spirit spirituality either. You mm -hmm. know. Um, because they kind of go together um, yeah and you from what you said previously it sounds like your guess which i think is probably at least partly right is that he was just too concerned about um imposing yes content on to people yes i think that's really that phenomenological stance mm -hmm. of not wanting to impose concepts or expectations maybe also i don't know mm -hmm. um yes and i think in one of his videos recorded by nadalu he also says like yeah i'm focusing as a portal and it's not my mission to talk about what's what's behind the portal or behind that mm -hmm. door yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting for me if if the emphasis is on the positive that um it's meant somehow to be life affirming or very very expansive or something but for me it seems like it's a lack of trust mm. if you have to always spin things towards the positive it's not like it's there you have to actually spin it to be there there's a lack of trust that what is real isn't somehow good enough yeah yeah or can be lived with or isn't itself life affirming even if it's not what you want yes yes yeah i i agree i agree and yeah. yeah um yes okay <laughs> let me ask another question about no no no, no. I, I think it's, it's really important yeah um yeah i think it has something to do with with trust mm -hmm. And with what what Victor Frankl calls basic trust, yeah, it's like. But I find it actually difficult myself. Like, can I trust a process that does not only entail the positive? Yes, right, or that has the capacity also for pain and destruction. Um, and I well, find that that's yeah. an interesting question. Uh, for me, I would say at this point in my life, I have reluctantly seemed to be coming to the point of view, which I still feel wary about, that the carrying forward can be trusted. Um, it can be trusted to uh, take me closer to a kind of a truthfulness. Mm -hmm. Yes. So truthfulness is it becomes the value rather than positivity or something that feels good. It's actually it it believes it's better for me to face the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's going to take me. And I can defend myself against that. I can try to avoid it. But if I give in to it, um, it yeah. can be a, a difficult reality. And yet, it, as I said before, it feels better to be there. Yes, and also um, it's saying yes to life, actually. Yes, yeah, as it is. As it is, as it yeah. is. Um, like, what is it? Amor fati, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really agree. I really agree, and it's, uh, yeah. And maybe it's, I was just thinking of the experiences of sitting across from someone who's focusing, and I'm either a therapist or a listener and i can may, I, i'm thinking now that it's 
maybe a lot easier to trust the process that they're having <laughs> than, than when I'm the one having the process. <laughs> yeah. And at those existential moments, you're both, or we are both in a in in that process a larger yeah. living process but really living process mm -hmm. which means that you don't know what will come exactly right exactly. and we don't know what will happen to the world you know and we are yeah for me that's kind of also life affirming we are part of a of a huge cos cosmic something mm -hmm. that expands and we are on a planet that will with the sun that will disappear at some point but we are part of like a much larger system yeah um and that runs through us yes right that, yeah as Jenlin occasionally said it's like it's living us it's living us and we mm -hmm. are expressions of yeah that larger living process yeah. which we hardly understand yeah or can understand yeah and uh and everything is part of it yeah. yeah, I find that very invigorating. I uh, just the way you've said that, I really, really appreciate that. Um, it makes me wonder how that fits with the broader culture of psychotherapy that's becoming more and more about sort of concrete treatments and manuals and the larger culture that seems to become more and more about sort of certainty and um conclusions and polarizations and polarizations exactly because it's also about like uh, we for one reason or another it's like we have more and more difficulties to 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 towards the openness towards what you call truth mm -hmm. right or reality with all its different aspects and colors and shapes yeah um yes I think in the therapy world, what is interesting that is that also in CBT, um, I think there is actually more space for, that's a, at least what I experience here at the university or also at, at, at other places, mm -hmm. there is a curiosity towards the existential realm and towards the unknown mm -hmm. and a kind of um, the um, thought that maybe not everything can be measured or like it's not that clear that therapy always leads to a positive outcome because it's not I mean that's what we aim for and it works at least as good as medicine but also medicine doesn't mm -hmm. always lead to a good outcome you now yeah. we seem to forget that yeah or surgery doesn't always lead to a good outcome um and I think there is a um a degree of growing openness towards the importance of the, the the person of the therapist you know there's a lot of studies being done about that um the importance of the person of the therapist of emotion regulation in these kinds of terms mm -hmm. and also um in some cbt circles the um the fact that our people are searching for meaning and come to a therapist with that mm -hmm these days right like i don't know what to do with my life like why are are we here yeah it's, it's encouraging to think that maybe things are becoming a little more intermingled in the therapy world i think so yeah that's at least what i'm experiencing here um it doesn't mean that it's everywhere in the world but there is like um yeah, maybe it has something to do with our times also that we are living in with yeah. climate change and with all those things like it's hard not to see uh existential issues around us you know they're mm -hmm. they're just there but maybe i'm just also just uh after reading so much about it and studying it you know it's <laughs> to see it in so maybe I'm not a good example, but I think, yeah, also for other people, it's just there when there's yeah. like the forests are burning and you have floods and there's yeah. migration and we have like pandemic and who knows what is waiting for us. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
and at the same time rather than a kind of a solidarity amongst human beings there's this strange polarization where you have to be in one tribe or another yeah that's easier right i mean that's searching for certitudes or that's yeah. like yeah uh, maybe i wouldn't call it panic but it's maybe we're all just searching for something to cling on like um yeah so how do we make uncertainty valuable to people yeah what do you think <laughs> <laughs> you make um, me very uncertain no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah i don't know i i think that if we begin to talk about uncertainty as an accomplishment rather than as a failure yes um and if we can start to spread that point of view and combine it with this is my, my own pet project at the moment in my mind not in reality um combine it with teaching people how to listen because the listening process as a listener you have to make peace with not knowing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're following a process that the person you're listening to doesn't even know and that kind of radical uncertainty and not knowing it accomplishes so many things at once if we can open up to it, it i think it brings people together it's hard to feel the same about somebody that you've just listened to for 15 minutes who's in a deep process yes and also it makes me think on, on about um, curiosity mm -hmm. because if you already know yes there is nothing new happening and i think curiosity uncertainty of course it's not the same but it's um it's an openness in some it's way. an openness yes yeah. um kirk snyder just wrote a book on life enhancing anxiety mm. so uh yeah how do we uh, help people to be curious mm -hmm. to be open and to be with uncertainty and i was just giving a class last week or this week and i was talking about a client of mine and we just had two sessions so it's a, a therapy class uh, with, with uh, people who are in their masters of clinical psychology mm -hmm. and i said i don't know what 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 is happening in this therapy at this moment <laughs> she has those experiences somewhere over here and we know that it has something right with uncertainty she's talking about uncertainty and i said i don't know what uncertainty is about and she doesn't know what do you think <laughs> so they had like some hypothesis and i said okay i will let you know further in the therapy <laughs> i don't know <laughs> and you see those students like what he doesn't know what kind of therapy is this <laughs> right? and i think this is um like feeding into the curiosity the adventure yeah yeah so yeah. The, yeah the adventure the not knowing and it's a little bit unsettling because mm -hmm. it's indeed not really how people think things mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. right or therapy works or other things work yeah you should know you should know and i said to my students i don't know mm -hmm. so i will keep you informed what we find there or what we discover yeah that sounds pretty yeah. I'm, I'm realizing we don't have a lot of time i'm just curious what's sort of what's next for you or is there anything else is kind of brought up that you would like to mention i would really would like to thank you for you know this talk i i really enjoyed it mm -hmm. and i also hope i think maybe there is a hope to i don't know to to um to um incorporate you know uh this uncertainty in focusing and in focusing oriented therapy and uh with the whole community to to debate or to discuss or to have dialogues mm -hmm. and to see also like how does this actually how can it come together with Jenlin's process model yeah yes and uh, yeah great thank you so much I've really enjoyed it 
and um, when it's complete, I'll send it over and you can have a look and then we'll decide if it goes up. Good. Okay. okay. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. Bye bye. Yeah. Have a and great hope day. to see you soon in a different occasion or to yeah. talk or whatever. Me too. Okay. Bye. bye.